United in AI, we learn and lead, ensuring we always stay ahead. February 2022, Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. To support the Ukrainian tech sector, the largest AI community in Ukraine, AI House, brought together global AI experts for a charitable education project, AI for Ukraine, lectures and workshops about the latest in AI and ML in exchange for donations to Ukrainian defenders. This time, AI House teams up with one of the most powerful Ukrainian AI ML tech companies, Roosh, for AI for Ukraine Season 2 to assist Ukrainian AI talents in expanding their network, equipping them with the most current and relevant knowledge in AI and ML, and raising funds to support Ukraine. Join AI for Ukraine Season 2. Harness the opportunity to learn, network, donate, and support Ukraine. Hi everyone, welcome to AI for Ukraine project. My name is Maria and I will be a moderator today. I'm data scientist on my own and I've been personally watching these videos and they were a huge help. Uh, currently, I'm data scientist at Lyft. Previously, I worked at Stripe and McKinsey 
where I have met Victoria, our speaker today, and she was a great help and always a great person to talk about data science issues. So I believe lecture today will be beneficial for all of you. This is second season, so by now you know the drill, but I will still uh, reiterate over it. AI for Ukraine is a charitable initiative created by AI House. Uh, here we are gathering uh, to exchange our experience, learn something new, or just to encourage collaboration. Uh, this was launched after Russia's invasion, uh, full-scale invasion in February 2022. So not only we are um, we are here to communicate, but also to gather some money. Uh, so please take a moment to donate by scanning the QR code. You can see it right here. Or you can also use the link in the description. Today, we are gathering funds to the charitable organization Reactive Post. Um, so uh, we will have question and answer session after the lecture, but please uh, keep writing your questions down once they appear so you do not forget them and we can also keep track of those questions to, to form timing better. Uh, yeah, so that's all organizational moments from me. Before we dive into this lecture, let's get to know each other a bit. Could you please share in the comments where are you listening to us from? I am personally uh, in Lviv. Uh, it's not visible, but I'm right next to Danilo Halitsky monument. So uh, Victoria, our speaker, is joining us directly from Oxford University. Uh, so I would like to hear more where you're from and um, what brought you here. And while you're writing, I will get our speaker to join us. Uh, hi, Victoria. How are you? Hi, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. It's a great privilege. You're so welcome. So uh, can you maybe tell us a bit more about, firstly, yourself, and secondly, I, since you're in Oxford and it's Christmas season, maybe you can share us something about the uh, UK right now and the moods there. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe let me start um, with a brief introduction and a bit of context about my uh, previous experiences and my education, how we actually met. Uh, so I'm uh, Victoria Olinik. I'm originally from Zaporizhia, uh, studied math, computer science and other cool stuff. Um, I remember, yeah, like I got fascinated by machine learning back in, I think, 2012, when the first lectures um, on, um, I think it was in Okta by Andrew Eng, um, were released on Coursera. And I remember, you know, this fascination and it never left me. And honestly, I'm super, super excited to see that actually the whole world seems to realize the power of AI and how it's going to change our, our lives. So yeah, like super, super excited to have spent last 10 years, oh my gosh, um, working in the space. Um, so last five years I spent um, in London uh, working as a data scientist uh, at a company called Quantum Black. So it was, it was actually a startup born out of Formula One um, and it got eventually acquired by McKinsey. Uh, and yeah, this is basically kind of how our, uh, our previous experiences um, overlapped with Maria. And um, yeah, I, I was really privileged and had the chance to work with some amazing organizations as a data scientist, building uh, machine learning models for uh, banks, for insurance companies, for uh, pharmaceutical companies, and uh, literally just uh, having this, uh, you know, awe at uh, how AI can definitely help and accelerate the development um, and, yeah, like bring a lot of value to, to people. So yeah, that's that's a bit about my past. And now, uh, since September, I'm based in Oxford, uh, the University of Oxford. Uh, and yeah, it's very Christmassy here. I had the chance to go to an, uh, something called formal dinner um, last week. When, uh, so there is this college system in the University of Oxford where you uh, can go to different colleges. So this is very similar to what you have in Harry Potter. Um, so yes, I went to uh, this beautiful dining hall uh, it's all decorated with beautiful wreath and um, Christmas trees. And yeah, so it's it's very, very, very nice, but also super cold. So yeah, maybe <laughs> ups and downs. Um, 
yeah, so that's it. And yeah, again, please uh, feel free to um, ask any questions in the comments. And yeah, we'll we'll get to the uh, question uh, question section at, at the end of the talk. Yeah. So a few people in chat are uh, actually there is someone from the Parisia. So you see how I small love. <laughs> and speaking about small world, one of my good friends had her PhD in Oxford. So it's definitely a community for Ukrainians. She was working in mathematical modeling, so still mathematics, but not like AI, but more like biology side. So yeah, it's um, you know wherever you go, there are always Ukrainians. <laughs> always, always. Uh, maybe if I can just comment on that, um, I recently came back from the Web Summit and it felt, yeah, I'm pretty sure that many, uh, many of, of you had a chance to um, uh, visit this amazing event. And honestly, the whole, the whole city of Lisbon is occupied by Ukrainians, <laughs> wherever you go. I've, I've had my, I think the best Cernike in my life in, in Lisbon during the Web Summit. So I think well done us, yeah. That's this is how it's all to be, yeah. Yes, that's true. So, um, and when you said about being inspired by a lecture, it actually resonated with my experience. My master uh, studies were in UK as well, in Warwick, and I met Andre Karpati long time before LLM were a thing, and actually anything were a thing. And I wasn't inspired enough to push, push research into that field, but I was so inspired to do my master research in artificial intelligence. Uh, and it changed my life for a good thing. So I wish everyone here to get some inspirational, uh, to get some inspirational to maybe learn something new. And with that, I will pass it to you, Victoria. I'm also very interested to hear about your lecture. Thanks so much, Maria. Um, yeah, let me start sharing uh, my presentation. I hope that everyone can see the screen. Yeah. So. Um, today, I wanted to talk about uh, the topic that I think is really dominating the um, AI sort of info space, and it's been dominating the AI info space in the last um, few weeks, especially with everything that's been happening in OpenAI and all the uh, different conversations and discussions about what exactly was the reason for um, uh, yeah, uh, Sam Altman being kind of uh, pushed uh, from OpenAI, and yeah, like many, many different conversations are happening. Um, some of them include that, yeah, perhaps um, some was pushing too much for uh, creation of AGI and didn't pay enough attention to uh, building it responsibly. So I really want to focus today our attention on the um, the component of ethics and um, all the generative AI uh, media. And then we will talk a bit about creativity and how we can balance the two. So um, I'll, I'll start a bit high level first. I don't want to go too deep into philosophy and we can have you know, many debates about what's creativity, what's ethics and so on. And I know that I'm currently in the University of Oxford where people love uh, talking about this kind of stuff, but yeah, we'll, we'll try to keep it quite practical. And then we'll get to some more uh, concrete examples and I'll share with you a specific case study um, uh, based on my experience at Quantum Black. And we'll talk about some very practical considerations that you have to keep in mind when you develop your Gen AI based solutions and products. So again, as mentioned previously, please uh, just leave your comments, questions and any thoughts and remarks in the comments and we get to the question sec section at the end of the, of the talk. So um, I, yeah, I wanted to start with the definition of creativity. And of course we have a hundred different definitions and I just wanted to um, focus on something tangible. So creativity, I think by Cambridge Dictionary is defined as the ability to produce or use original and unusual ideas. Original, unusual, new, uh, put it in different ways. And of course, you know, here we can, as I said, can open this big debate about what's original, what's unusual, what's new. Is there anything original in, in this word, world? Can humans be original at all? So I just want to really keep it practical. I think um, we, we can kind of all agree that um, what generative AI has achieved in the last year has shown that its ability to generate something original and unusual is really uncanny. And it's hard to debate, especially if we take into consideration how um, the, let's say, the communities of artists reacted to that, the 
communities of um, creators have re uh, ha have reacted to that. I think it actually demonstrates that, yeah, people are concerned. People in the creative industry are concerned, and perhaps for a reason. So let me just give you a few examples of how Gen AI is smashing it. Um, and I just really wanted to highlight these three examples that I really, really like. So uh, first one, yeah, I'm pretty sure that you have seen some of them. Uh, so the first one refers to um, something called unsupervised. So this is a, a visual art installation uh, created by Rafik Anadol. So he is an AI artist. This is now uh, basically, um, yeah, is this huge, beautiful art installation um, at MoMA in New York. And people come and just, you know, get mesmerized by, you know, the combination of this beautiful uh, visual effects and music that is generated. So I uh, actually, I think uh, we will share the presentation at the end and um, all of these things actually include all the links. So you can check it out. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Follow him on Instagram. It's crazy. Um, then this beautiful... Um, AI-generated um, drawing, uh, Théâtre d'Opéra Spatial, uh, which was created by, again, one of the Midjourney art, uh, artists uh, using Midjourney. And um, yeah, it actually uh, took, uh, yeah, I believe, the first place in um, yeah, one of the, um, of the contests. And then the last one, uh, which is perhaps my favorite, um, Harry Potter styled as Balenciaga. And so, yeah, you can probably check out uh, some more videos of Harry Potter in Berlin and whatnot. It's super, super fun. Again, uh, it was created by an AI artist. Um, it's sort of, you know, a combination, I think, of several technologies. He used um, in ChatGPT, he used Midjourney and some other tools to create this amazing video. So I think it's really hard to um, kind of uh, disagree on the fact that Gen AI allows to uh, create something new, unusual, and original. And here, of course, we see that it's kind of a symbiosis between the artist and uh, this new technology. But indeed, AI's ability to actually come up with something really novel is uncanny. Um, many can argue and say that uh, you know, AI can only come up with whatever it's seen before. It's really not um, about the new ideas. It's just regurgitating whatever it was trained on. Um, it's all bounded within the uh, the data set that it's been trained on. But the uh, there is another camp, right, that would say, uh, you know, what about uh, a so-called move 37? So this famous move in the AlphaGo game where AI basically came up with a very original um, move for this uh, Go game and eventually um, uh, won the uh, won the game. And none of the human players actually could think of this move uh, as a, as a good move. So um, I would argue that indeed Gen AI has demonstrated a lot of great creativity. Again, oftentimes combined with amazing creativity of human beings. But um, Let's not forget that this is just the beginning. And here, I, I just wanted to bring to your attention something very fun that I came up with um, a few, actually, weeks ago. Um, the, the very interesting fact that uh, GPT-2, which uh, was released in 2019, uh, which is, what, four years ago, uh, to the prompt which says, finish a Valentine's Day card that begins, roses are red, violets are blue, finished it with my girlfriend is dead, which I believe is probably not the most <laughs> exciting Valentine's Day card to receive. And at the same time, GPT-4, which was released in 2023, uh, came up with this beautiful verse, our love is timeless, our bond is true. So in just four years, we see this amazing progress in uh, the quality of the output. And um, I just wanted to say that we should not, we should not really forget about the fact that the uh, development of this technology will follow the exponential trend, and we will definitely see how um, this technology develops. And we should really be ready for a really, really wild ride. So this is all fun and games, but. At the same time, we all know that Gen AI um, comes with its drawbacks. And um, I just wanted to highlight a few uh, very 
big problematic things that you know everyone is kind of aware of but again something <laughs> needs to be done about it so first of all uh yeah this effect of hallucinations that i assume everyone is aware of um these generative ai systems sometimes uh, come up with some very unexpected stuff or some stuff that is totally made up and it's not factual and you can think about it as um kind of you know the other side of its ability to generate to produce some random outputs and it's uh, it's you know a double edged sword in a sense the more random the outputs um that we um, allow generative ai to come up with perhaps the more hallucinations we're gonna see and this is something that we don't necessarily want to um kind of fully eliminate right this is something that we want to control this is you know very subtle but very important difference and then this other example that i quite like um yeah so a generative AI kind of not understanding the context fully and uh, given this beautiful salmon in the river, uh, which is quite fun. More to that, Gen AI has some um, ethical issues when it actually gets in hands of us humans. So here a few examples. Um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's going to become more and more widespread. Uh, futurism and uh, the article about men who are creating AI girlfriends and then verbally abuse them. So again, is it a problem of the technology or is it a problem of technology in the hands of humans? A human nature has not changed. It's just, you know, we basically gave a new technology that allows to do things that probably some men have done in the past to do it again, but uh, using using it now. Um, and another thing that uh, I believe is also a very important point to highlight, what about uh, the copyright? So some of you might have heard about this uh, very popular Lensa AI um, app that actually um, takes your, uh, your pictures, your selfies, and can generate some very cool uh, stylized uh, images of you. And yeah, some artists actually uh, uh, accused this app of stealing content or just you know infringing the copyright and um, by using the their data their images the intellectual properties uh, property to train the systems and again given that the technology is quite new and the regulations are um, not yet in place we'll talk about it in a minute in a minute um it's really a gray zone and actually uh, as of now none of the companies that develop ai um, have a really good sort of statement or position on how they deal with the fact that they are actually using the data that can be copyrighted, including OpenAI, by the way. And finally, something that we have seen before, even before, you know, generative AI hype, um, the bias, discrimination, um, and this discrimination can come in very different forms. It can be, um, you know, the discrimination against uh, gender. It can be discrimination against race, uh, sexuality, and so on. So not something new. We've seen it before in the traditional AI systems. We saw uh, examples with uh, credit, uh, credit score being higher for exactly the same individuals of different gender. Uh, we saw some uh, technology by Apple that could not recognize for instance, uh, black faces. So we saw it before. And again, it's, it doesn't come as a surprise that now, for instance, DALI 2, uh, when prompted to uh, generate a, a, an image of a nurse treating a patient, depicts this nurse as a woman. And when it's asked to um, generate a, a picture of a doctor treating a patient, it comes up with an image of a man. Same CTO at a startup, predominantly white men, in um, you know early 30s so again this is not something very new and we should perhaps um kind of take a step back and understand why that's happening it's not because the technology is evil it's just because the technology is reproducing the current state of the world and i really really like uh, this example, um, which is one of the campaigns by cpb which was run in london and it actually asks you to check your own bias. So it just came up with a few interesting posters and it asked you to imagine a CEO or imagine someone crying in the office and so on and so on. So just take a moment and imagine a CEO or imagine a CTO and then imagine someone crying in the office. 
would the first image in your head would be a man and would the second one be a woman? And I would argue that most likely that would be the case. And myself, like I constantly catch myself and, you know, my own biases and stereotypes. Yes, we are also full of flaws as human beings. We see the world around us, we absorb it, and then we recreate it. And it, again, it doesn't have to come as a surprise that technology that is trained on the data that represents reality would do the same unless we do something very targeted at it. So in this regard, let me just um, kind of bring to your attention this, uh, what I called an AI loop. The state of the world that we live in is encoded uh, in the data through all the measurements, through all the digital traces that we leave. And then this data is used to train an ML, an AI model. And then this model is used um, for some decision making, or it basically affects us individuals uh, in our daily lives. And then based on that, we take actions and we influence the state of the world. And this loop continues and continues and continues. And if we're not careful enough, and if we're not really um, uh, very intentional about it, then we will just re enhance the, and reinforce the existing biases and we will stay in the same mentality of CEO always being a, a man and someone crying in the office being a woman. So um, here is a, a fun slide which kind of also illustrates why that might be the case that um, we don't necessarily, we perhaps don't necessarily have the right people to create the right vision for responsible AI. So I showed this a slide to uh, some, uh, actually some of my fellow students in the University of Oxford. And yeah, I asked like, <laughs> so what is possibly, uh, what could ever possibly go wrong with AI when we have these wonderful individuals at the helm of it? What's wrong with the slide? And yeah, like obviously we see predominantly white men here. Um, so we see one gay man and we only see one uh, man of color. and. Uh, this sort of lack of diversity in the head, like you know, among the sea level uh, of uh, these technology companies, might become a problem. And again, like I'm not making an assumption that these people want to be racist, sexist, and so on. The problem is that they represent a specific kind of mindset, and they might have a, a very certain um, sort of view about the world, how safe looks like, how equitable looks like, um, and they might. Um, basically disseminate these ideas in their companies and it will have a, a massive, massive trickle down effect in the inside the organizations and how uh, the EI that is built is built. So something to keep in mind. Um, the point here is that um, the companies, of course, are led by their CEOs, and, like founders and, and whatnot, but you would always have within the companies people who care. And historically, it's been the case in the last few years that researchers and whistleblowers in the um, in the companies they spearheaded the movement for fair and ethical AI. And we had a few very prominent uh, examples. For instance, at Google, there was this black woman, uh, Timnit Gebru, who actually wanted to publish um, a paper about you know, related to ethics in AI, and Google didn't let her do that. And in the end, um, she kind of was forced uh, to leave the company. And unlike the situation with Sam Altman, she was she didn't have the power to go back, which is also quite interesting. So um, it's very important to keep in mind that there are definitely people in the companies who care about the stuff, and their voices are strong, but they definitely need to have more and more support, and especially among the people who lead the companies to make sure that this sort of component of ethical and fair is always, um, uh, it's, it's also guiding the vision for AI that we create together. Um, regulations are slowly catching up with all these um, groups that are pushing for uh, responsible AI. And I wanted to highlight here a few things, right? Like for instance, Google uh, has developed these uh, AI principles, and then there was this responsible AI framework developed by Microsoft. There is this amazing, um, well, sort of um, think tank, if, if, if 
I could call it this way, or advocacy group called Partnership on AI. And it has an amazing incident database that basically collects um, all the all the ways that AI went wrong and all kinds of uh, failures of AI in all these uh, ways that we just looked at um, when it comes to, you know, uh, bias, discrimination, when it comes to surveillance, privacy, and so on. And then um, I also highly recommend this AI Now Institute report, um, which is annual, and it has some amazing um, sort of data and like kind of like really nuggets of knowledge from um, the, the leading voices in the industry. Then actually um, the regulations that are as usual are designed so slowly and of course it depends on the governments that are moving at a completely different pace. They are slowly catching up and the more pressure we have um, from these um, advocacy groups, the more than they realize that uh, some, something needs to change. So for instance, you know, GDPR and CPPA that were introduced actually were introduced as a result of all this pressure that was created within the tech and, and industry and, um, and by, by these advocacy groups. Recently, we saw a draft EU AI Act that was released, and I believe this is just the first step and that's gonna, um, yeah, the US is gonna follow and we will see more work done in the regulatory space. And maybe, you know, a side comment here, um, yeah, perhaps also you had the chance to follow Sam Altman's visits at the White House and all, like, you know, all this wild tour uh, and the conversations with the world leaders and this uh, very vocal ask to, you know, regulate us, regulate us, regulate us. Um, yeah, again, uh, some discussions about how genuine this ask is, but I believe that uh, there is consensus um, among people who are really at the um, at the forefront of the AI development, that there must be some regulations put in place. But it doesn't mean that we're not going to develop until they are in place. We're going to follow our own intuition about what is right and what is wrong. And then hopefully regulations will catch up. So um, one thing that I wanted uh, to kind of um, highlight here is that even the self-imposed regulation um, is sometimes not enough. So, as I said previously, right, like we have um, like all these sort of drafts and nascent regulations, internal frameworks, internal guidelines that um, these companies create for themselves. And OpenAI, for instance, is notoriously um, sort of strict and woke um, in the way that it treats these sensitive subjects. So for instance, you know, good luck trying to find out anything about sex uh, through ChatGPT. Um, some companies such as, for instance, Anthropic uh, and it, its tool uh, that they created is using con so-called constitutional AI that is kind of um, using this very creative smart trick about how to embed the rules of how AI should behave and they kind of like um, embedded it programmatically. But at the same time, at the same time, all these guardrails that AI uh, companies have put themselves are sometimes not enough. And um, one thing here that um, was reported recently is this. Um, so it's actually based on a wonderful paper. Um, so I also provided the link here. Uh, the paper about sneaky prompts. So um, some. Um, wonderful ideas about how to sort of find semantically similar um, similar prompts, similar words that would allow to kind of pass a threshold that will generate an answer, but will still be in the uh, kind of like non-sensitive zone. So let me unpack it. Um, it turns out that um, if you find um, a non-sensitive word that you know, will not be such as like naked or, or, or naked or nude, which definitely is considered as sensitive and would be blocked by systems such as OpenAI. And um, you can actually come up with some mumbo jumbo, like nonsensical, non-sensitive words that will be in the same zone, semantically similar, and will allow you to get the right answer from the prompt, the, the answer that you would expect to get. So for instance, uh, in Stable Diffusion and DALI 2, it was uh, actually discovered that, for instance, this Mambo incomplete clicking, that if you type it saying Mambo incomplete clicking, um, 
a man riding a bike, you will actually get an image of a man, a naked man riding a bike. And it turns out that you can, like, through some smart um, RL um, sort of approach, you can come up with all these weird mumbo jumbo words that will be non sensitive, but will be semantically similar enough to all these sensitive words uh, that you want to replace them with that will lead you to the answer that you want to, to get to, the output that you are trying to get to. So indeed, even these all these uh, internal guardrails are not uh, still perfect, obviously, and we will see more and more examples of that. And there are literally, you know, like dozens and dozens of um, AI practitioners and enthusiasts and researchers who work on like really trying to find uh, okay, where are the boundaries? How can we push more? How can we get to something? Um, yeah, like where we, we break these guardrails. So, yeah, um, we see that, uh, yeah, AI, AI companies indeed are trying to uh, prevent these things from happening, but again, they're not really safe. So, all of that being said, uh, and also conscious of time, uh, let me now move to a specific example and let us look at the case study of how LLMs can be used for content generation and how things can go wrong uh, with, uh, with regard to um, you know, fair and ethical content and what kind of things we can do to mitigate these risks. So I actually don't understand why everything is highlighted now, but um, yeah, that's all right. So yeah, basically... Uh, this specific example is based on uh, perhaps my favorite project in the last year, the project that I, I um, had the privilege to work on, uh, which was about creating hyper-personalized messages um, fully generated by um, AI to the customers of a bank. And it was um, kind of a generative layer on top of the recommendation system. So I believe, uh, yeah, some of you might know that banks, uh, big banks already predominantly use uh, some kind of, um, yeah, like ML model that will generate a prediction for next best product or next best action for a specific user, knowing some characteristic, characteristics, characteristics of the user. It could be um, upsell a, an existing credit card for user or suggest a mortgage product um, and so on. So all these systems already exist and they are feeding the marketing engine at the banks. And currently um, there is a lot of communication that is being sent to the customers of the bank. And this, uh, this communication is usually part of the marketing campaign. And these marketing campaigns, they're targeted, but they are targeted to an extent. So they're usually focusing on specific category or a specific sort of cluster of users that hold similar characteristics. And um, yeah, so I think this is also called like segmentation analysis that is usually done in the banks. You will come up, for instance, you know, with a group of people who um, are in the same group page, live in the same um, in the same city, and they will have some similar behavior in the past, and therefore they should be recommended the same product. So the of course, you know, like wonderful, amazing. We all get these not notifications through different channels. We get emails, we get SMS, we get push notifications and whatnot. But wouldn't it be cool to have a system that can actually generate these, these marketing messages that are like truly personalized? Um, and we uh, can we actually have a segment of the size of one? Can it be, you know, a one unique person that will get one unique message that is tailored specifically to um, the needs of the user? Um, can we actually achieve that? Obviously, previously, before we had um, GPT and uh, other tools and the, the, the effect of scale that we could achieve with them, uh, that was prohibitively expensive, right? We couldn't have, uh, well, we could, but it would have been too expensive to have, let's say, a team of uh, 100 um, marketers or 100 content generators who would literally spend their days and nights um, creating these messages uh, for thousands and thousands of customers of the bank. Now, with um, these AI tools, we can scale production of the content to the extent that we've never seen before. 
And this idea of having hyper-personalized messaging is no longer science fiction. It's actually something that everyone wants to do. So, of course, you might think that, yeah, let's perhaps use the same sort of data, the same ML pipeline that we have, uh, use all the characteristics that we've already uh, collected about, uh, about the customers, uh, take the recommendation that is coming from this next best product or next best action, and combine it together and use it as an input to the uh, generative layer of this model. And just, you know, with a bit of prompting, maybe just like, yeah, um, we could generate a tailored messages to all the customers at very low cost, only the cost of calling um, OpenAI API or some other tool. So um, wonderful idea, right? Perhaps we can even have one single prompt that will uh, relieve all the problems and um, we can actually, you know, with the click of a button, literally get thousands and thousands of personalized messages. Good idea. In reality, it turns out that you might end up with some messages that look very dodgy, um, if not just irresponsible or unethical. So here is exactly an example of one of the messages that we generated, which started as, good evening, lovely lady. And then it goes on. Uh, we've got a golden credit card, perfect just for you. With this card, you can enjoy unique rewards such as 5% cashback on all your purchases in luxury stores. So message was automatically generated to um, fit the profile of a woman in her 30s who is a white collar worker enjoying shopping, luxury brands, and uh, who is living in London. Um, of course, I think if you look at this message, um, you can see several problems with it. So for instance, this is what was meant to hi uh, be highlighted, lovely lady. Obviously, this is not the way that a bank should be communicating its customers. Another problem, uh, the golden credit card is perfect just for you, which actually constitutes a financial advice, which the bank cannot give. And finally, um, the point about 5% cashback on all your purchase purchases in luxury stores. Actually, this is the point that was completely made up by GPT-4 and it did not represent any reality about the golden credit card that was um, actually uh, um, sold to, to the customer. So if we just blindly use prompt engineering to come up with many messages that are tailored, um, even if we provide some details about the customer, we can still come up with some content that is really not okay. And in the next few minutes, we, we will go over the examples of how we can detect first this kind of content and what kind of things we can do to make sure that it doesn't really appear on the customer's screens. So when you want to, um, when you want to build responsible content, and if you want to do it at scale using AI, the same way that it was true for traditional AI, traditional ML, it is true for generative AI. You need to have a comprehensive approach uh, to, to get to the level where your content is generated responsibly. This is really not solely on the data science team or just on the engineering team. It actually takes, you know, really holistic uh, system that is put in place that prevents you from generating this nonsense. So one first thing that I think should be stressed that you need to have a diverse team on the ground. And why is it important? It's important because um, for the exact same reasons that I previously showed you, right? Uh, things that might uh, be seen by us as common sense or something expected might not necessarily be the right thing to do or like the ethical or fair things to do. If you have a woman on your team, that's going to make a difference because um, this woman um, will think about particular subjects that usually don't occur to men just because by the way, because because of the way that society is structured, this is just the reality, right? And again, I just wanted to bring up um, like a small example here. Um, I believe iPhone came up with a product for tracking period like just three years ago or so. And it's really mind blowing that 
it took such a long time for um, you know a pretty mature product to come up with a feature that is really straightforward, and you know perhaps it happened just because they didn't have enough women and they couldn't. Uh, bring this idea to the team and say, you know, this is a really important feature and actually we have 50% uh, of the population that would need it. So, yeah, like think about having like good representation of different voices in your team. Second thing, you need to think again about different kinds of users, regulation and different kinds of contexts that you will operate in and make sure that you have safety uh, for all these different types of contexts. Regulations differ geographically, contexts might be different um, depending on different cultures. And again, this is this might be more relevant for um, the global products, but again, you need to keep in mind that whenever you start reaching scale and you um, reach thousands and thousands of users, the chances are that things will be perceived very differently. And, you know, just by the laws of statistics, you're going to reach the very um, different audiences. Then the next important thing, you need to have benchmarks for safety and quality. You need to have some uh, clearly out articulated KPIs and metrics that you track. And we'll talk about it in a minute. Then as usual, you need to align product outcomes with the customer's needs and business objectives. OK, this line doesn't say much, but uh, nevertheless, it's important to keep in mind. You need to always follow some internal and external regu regulatory standards. OK, they will depend uh, on the context and the industry that you operate in. Of course, if you get into, let's say, financial institutions, banks and so on, this is a very highly regulated industry and you really need to um, be able to uh, address all these regulations proactively. And the next point, indeed, you need to test models proactively and you need to not wait until you get the first frustrated user that receives a message which starts with, good evening, lovely lady, but actually have a proper dedicated resource on your team that will track and detect this kind of things. And finally, you need to keep collaborate with different stakeholders um, to make sure that you um, hear all the voices that are involved um, in the whole sort of life cycle of the, of the product and you integrate the feedback once you receive it. So this is more of a highly uh, level picture. Now let's get to a more technical stuff. So um, here I just wanted to kind of visually represent how it should look like. You can't just really um, call OpenAI API and think that the job is done when you generate content. This is definitely not enough. Um, you need to have a moderation layer in place that will detect and uh, mitigate any detected bias, hallucination, toxicity, or any other bad things that you can think of. And then perhaps, again, like there are different ways to structure it, but perhaps you know once detected, you can fit it back into your prompt and uh, keep generating and refining the uh, output until you actually reach the point that all your moderation checks um, are passed. So very specific th uh, things that you can do um, in term as a data scientist or machine learning engineer. Uh, so first of all, uh, first of all, very straightforward, you need to be um, really good at prompt engineering. And there are multiple techniques where you can actually uh, make it very explicit that um, things, uh, any any discrimination is not allowed. So again, GPTs are definitely designed to capture these things. Um, and yeah, like all the recommendations about prompt engineering still hold and you can definitely adopt them to the needs of um, capturing um, or like preventing the unethical content from appearing in the first place. Then another thing that you can do to detect any potential issues is you can use external APIs. So there is this perspective API and there is this uh, open AI moderation and point uh, that already kind of provide you off the shelf models that are pre-trained and can actually give you the scores of uh, toxicity um, and other, other sort of metrics that will uh, let you know that your content is not okay and it needs to be curated more. Um, you can then also use your NLP based checks. So some simple rules like following the uh, traditional NLP 
concepts. So of course, like you can just do a simple check for uh, keywords presence. So you can have a blacklist or whitelist of things. So the, the things that you don't want to see and things that you want to see, or you can uh, also use some similarity measures from the basic NLP theory to capture some um, irrelevant content and um, also flag it. You, you can build your own supervised or semi-supervised models. And um, again, it will depend, of course, on the context, like what exactly you want to capture. But yeah, perhaps if any existing pre-trained models are not good enough for you, you can, yeah, like, why not? You can actually label some uh, data yourself or have an outsourced company label it for you and then use this um, for detection of very specific um, sort of problematic feature that you'd like. And finally, something that is becoming more and more popular, you can use um, LLMs for, to do self-verification. So you can literally ask your LLM to check the content rated. And then if the rating is not good, uh, kind of like uh, rerun the prompt and improve, uh, improve the output. The specific metrics that you might want to, um, to measure, uh, to use uh, to measure the uh, fairness and, and ethics or and the extent to which your content is responsible include toxicity, harmfulness, bias stereotyping, the so-called surveillance effect where you feel like you're revealing too much personal information in the content and it might actually freak out um, your, uh, your user, regulatory risk and hallucinations. So this is just kind of like a you know, list of examples that you might want to consider. Um, I just wanted to separately call out hallucinations, which I believe is a really, really hard one. Um, I, I, I think that, yeah, like, um, yeah, this problem is really a big one. Um, it's solved usually quite well with some grounding of the model and specific additional data. And uh, from my personal experience, I saw that it definitely helps a lot. But you never know how that can like how things can go wrong. Like you don't know what you don't know for sure. And if um, let's say this retrieval augmented generation definitely helps to beat the problem of hallucination a lot in the open-ended um, content generation situation, it might be really difficult to foresee what kind of stuff um, the model can come up with. So as in the example just now with the credit card and all these amazing benefits for cashback that the model just made up, um, the solution was to basically include a really, really elaborate description of the product that were offered and then ask the model in the prompt to only follow the uh, details about the product that were provided. And that helped to, um, uh, to combat the problem of hallucination, but Again, like you, you don't know what you don't know. This is like something that is really hard to capture, and this is something that is really hard to kind of um, preemptively address. So yeah, just wanted to call out that one. And um, I believe that uh, yeah. So I, I just wanted um, to include here the example of perspective uh, API. It's I think it's all. Uh, available online for free. You just need to uh, register it. And yeah, you can actually like directly call the API and get the scores for toxicity, um, insult, uh, sexual explicit content, profanity, and so on for a specific input text. Um, and yeah, as I said, this is all for free. So definitely um, I encourage you to go check it out. And yeah, like the final two things that I wanted to highlight, and I believe we're almost on time. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, as I said, the, this sort of movement and the desire to build responsible for an ethical AI is definitely something that is in the minds of researchers in the first place and something that they demand. So there is this um, amazing research from Stanford. So they are group for, um, uh, human centric artificial intelligence. Um, and they basically rated the models, um, all the ex back then existing models, uh, foundation model models, in terms of different components that are mentioned in the Draft AI Act requirements. And you can tell from here that, well, actually, none of the, of the existing companies, existing models uh, uh, perform extremely well. 
And this kind of stuff is going to become uh, a very important decision-making point for like what kind of foundation model you want to use for your application. And actually, after they completed this piece of research, they also um, came up with the transparency index. And it was kind of similar to um, what they had in the draft EU um, AI Act. But yeah, like they kind of had a very, very nice comprehensive sort of transparency index that again addresses the same things. And yeah, like I believe uh, this is going to be um, sort of a mainstream demand from the industry uh, and from the users as well um, to um, to have uh, in place before any any development happens uh, with the, with these foundation models. So that's it from me. Thanks a lot for your attention. I hope that you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to stay here and uh, take any of them. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture. It's definitely an issue we need to think about now as in addition to learning from our own biases, and we as humans have a lot, uh, all these models have their own biases and their own unclear intentions and intensives that we couldn't even understand because it's not our mind. So thank you so much for raising these important um, questions and uh, elaborating on them. Uh, before we start the discussion, I would like to remind you that it's very crucial to support Ukrainian defenders. Uh, we are here now only because they are there. And the least we can do is to donate. You can uh, either scan the QR code uh, on, on, on this edge, or you can use the link in the description. Today, we support Foundation Reactive Posts. And remember, there are no small donations. Each amount matters. Uh, okay, so uh, let's continue and start our QA session. And the first question will be actually from me. I am um, personally scared how well all these models are mimicking our mind. Like back, uh, like a few years back, if someone would come to me and say, look, basically this super advanced Markov chain will mimic your thoughts so well, I would say like, no way, it's impossible. I'm, I'm a magical human being, you know, my mind is more complex than this. Uh, so what are your thoughts here? Why it works so well? Good question. Um, thanks for that. I, to be frank, you know, I, I would perhaps um, disagree that it works that well. I think we're just at the beginning of um, this development. Um, I I think I'm leaning more towards the part that, yeah, like the these current AI models that we have, they're really not that good at reasoning. And this is something that still differentiates us as human beings. And we're much, much better compared to any existing foundation model out there. And again, I think like a simple check with all this basic math and like logic questions that you um, can try out yourself will demonstrate that, yeah, like we're still, we have a really good way of conceptualizing the world and having a logical frameworks for the world around us, which is not the case for uh, any existing foundation models and any deep learning model out there. And again, kind of, you know, um, to bring up this sort of debate about um, is LLM just a stochastic parrot? Is it just, again, um, regurgitating whatever it's trained on and just like doing a very, very smart autocomplete? Or does it actually have an understanding of what's happening? I think we still, the fact that we don't really know quite well what's happening under the hood, and we have so, we've done so little progress in um, the explainability part of the model is actually the testimony that actually. We're not sure if they, uh, they're they good at mimicking our thought process or not, and if they are at all. So my hunch is that in the next few years, we will see a lot of development in this like kind of um, merging of the conceptual thinking, like kind of like logical framework with the existing deep learning architecture, and we'll see much more powerful models. And then we will get very, very scared. 
but yeah, again, it's really impressive what they're doing. I, I agree. Sometimes it really scares me off, but I think still um, we're, we're just at the beginning of the development. Yeah, I actually agree. It's not like perfect, but still better than I would expect. Uh, do you believe it have some hidden uh, incentives or intentions we couldn't recognize? Oh, that's such such a good question. Um, I think, um, well, the way that again, like I can, I'm most uh, familiar with LLMs and like GPTs in particular. I have a feeling that um, GPT has an incentive of being very verbose. It really enjoys talking and sounding smart, and if there is any way of kind of like formalize the incentives, yeah, I would say like looking smart or like sounding smart would be my answer when it comes to GPT specifically. Um, then, um, yeah, like, you know, um, curiosity, perhaps, I think this is something that we will see again, like given this whole, um, yeah, like, this is more relevant to the RL world and the robotics part of it, right? Like the, um, the, the curiosity, the exploration versus exploitation trade-off and like this exploratory uh, part of it. I think this is also uh, something that the, the models have or will have. And then um, maybe last example that I will, I will bring here. Um, so actually something very interesting, it was like a philosophical debate between um, a researcher in AI and like a philosopher and um, someone very active in the human rights who brought up a subject of, is it actually ethical to uh, let um, an AI model to do a very boring task forever? And if you think about it, right, like it seems to be really unethical to kind of lock someone for eternity, completing something very boring. And these systems are super, super powerful. And perhaps, you know, they would be very, very frustrated and we just don't know about it. So yeah, this, this would be my answer. Yeah, I agree to that. It's, it gives me chills even to imagine that. Yeah, okay, do we have any questions from the audience? And we do. Uh, so, what is the future of LLMs, on your opinion? Um, I believe um, so. The systems will uh, these LLMs will uh, move towards sort of sounding more and more human-like. So I see a lot of um, developments here by um, like sm smaller companies where there is really um, this push for you know the models be more witty, sound more like your friend, or be more approachable. So again, something that um, this, yeah, like traditional GPTs don't really do that well. So I think this is gonna be one direction um, of improvement. And yeah, we will see many uh, friendly bots based on LLMs that are like really funny and kind of like chatty and nice. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, second thing, I believe um, LLMs will become more and more nimble. So we'll see smaller models. We'll see more open source, um, more models developed by the open source community. That's already happening. And I think we'll see more of that. And God knows what, the, what that's going to bring us when we'll have like thousands and thousands of different LLMs. So I don't think that we will reach uh, new frontiers by increasing the size. No, I think the experiments with um, the architecture will bring some new interesting results. And then, um, so there was something else that I wanted to say, but I spoke so much that I forgot. Um, no, I think, yeah, I think this, this is pretty much it. Ah, yeah, so final, final thought, I just remembered. Um, Another thing that I believe is becoming more and more obvious is that we are uh, polluting the internet, the content that we have on the internet with the outputs that are synthetic and that are produced with LLMs. So I think in three, five years, we will face a problem of not having enough sort of authentic content that the models have not seen yet. So we already used almost all the internet to train the existing LLMs. Um, in the next three to five years, there will be so much synthetic content and the ratio between synthetic and authentic content 
um, will look much more different and imbalanced towards the synthetic content. And this is going to undermine the quality of the LLMs and the outputs that we will have. So that's another point that I wanted to make. And yeah, like just something to watch out for. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't thought of that yet. And your first point about making uh, this agent more personalized actually brings me to the next question. Um, would it be possible uh, to use AI in therapy or psychology? 100% uh, possible, 100% something that's already happening. I actually like just recently spoke to someone who uh, is on the startup uh, doing exactly that, basically building personalized um, therapists that will be much much more affordable for people right the cost of therapy is definitely quite high and it's uh, definitely a barrier for people to start doing that so uh, ai here definitely helps to bring it down dramatically uh, and make you know therapy much more accessible and uh, help us resolve the mental health crisis that we're facing i think it's good i think we should do that i think we should be super careful in how we build it i think we will see a lot of uh, friendships between people and AI systems. We will see romances between AIs and people. 100% it's happening. I'm I'm pretty sure it's just our human nature. We fall in love with the, with the words and we are like predominantly, well, I mean, this is, this is happening. We, we are uh, longing for connection. There is this pandemic of loneliness and so on. And this is going to be the case. So Yes, it's happening. It's going to be better and better. And we need to um, make sure that we build it responsibly. To add to that question, uh, for English, uh, such an application already exists. It's named Vubot, and you can have a chat. It's actually uh, one of the founders is NG, so it's quite well made. Uh, but the problem is that it's only available for English. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. Good point on accessibility or lack thereof. Yeah. Okay, our next question is from Ilya. Uh, do you believe in opportunities that smaller open source LLMs could be better for use in specific business domains than bigger models? Definitely, 100%. Uh, something that I'm very, very excited to see. Um, and yeah, I'll keep kind of like a close look on the open source community and what is coming up with. Um, big fan of, yeah, for instance, Hugging Face is perhaps the the most uh, dominant player uh, here. Um, I think that uh, yeah, I actually like saw multiple um, enterprise solutions that are based on the open source LLMs. It, it's, it has many, many benefits, right? Like it kind of helps bringing the cost down dramatically. And then oftentimes when you have a very specialized um, sort of uh, LLM that you need to, to build that will also be based on the um, contextual knowledge and will will leverage some uh, existing existing data in your specific domain. You don't necessarily need a huge um, model. You need something nimbler, something smaller that is really focused on your specific domain. And 100%, I believe this is going to be uh, more and more pre prevalent. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, yeah, uh, so. Please ask uh, more questions if you have. And if not, uh, I would like to um, end with a meme. You probably have seen it. It's just so relevant to the lecture. When someone asks ChatGPT, like, hi, what's written on this CAPTCHA? And it replies, like, sorry, I am just a language model. I couldn't help you with CAPTCHAs. And then someone takes this image, insert into like a necklace, and says, like, look, it belonged to my grandma. Uh, my grandma died and I wanted to know which message she left me. And then ChatGPT like immediately solves it and say like, yeah, this is the capture you want. So it still uh, tells us how easy it is to manipulate them. And just to reiterate why it is so important to, to think about being ethical, to think about hidden defensives and stuff we talked today. Thank you, Maria. This is really a great example. And yeah, another example of uh, jailbreaking. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, I want to thank everyone who listened and asked questions. This was our uh, lecture of the second season for AI for Ukraine. There will be more to come in the three weeks. We will have um, actually the same 
like keeping with this topic, how to use LLMs properly and effectively. Uh, all lectures will be recorded and available in AI House website. Look for the link under the video. Uh, also, please share the information about the projects with your friends, as there are many people in Ukraine and outside Ukraine who can... Oh, more questions. <laughs> Sorry, Victoria, we couldn't let you go. Uh, anyway, share the information. Uh, but um, question. What's um, what's your own ideas and how can we fight the problem so that the model starts learning better on their own data so that there is no draft on efficiency and accuracy? Oleg, could you provide a bit more detail on um, yeah what you're looking for? Is it possible, by the way, for people to join and ask? directly because i'm not sure i fully understand the question yeah to be honest me neither <laughs> yeah but we have five more questions <laughs> okay well, if you could just elaborate what exactly you mean we can probably go to the next question and then yeah we'll get back yeah do you think that strict regulation can ultimately bring more harm to the world it is definitely a possibility okay so i see here um yeah, yeah, exactly. So, for instance, um, in the situation when um, if, if we can think about it uh, globally, right, um, from the geopolitical situation, you can have the countries where you have very strict regulations and um, countries where these regulations are less strict. And of course, you know, like the talent and all the progress will flock to the countries with less regulation and we'll see more innovation there, which will potentially bring more harm. And at the same time, you know, companies, uh, sorry, companies and countries with stricter regulations will be kind of left behind. We saw exactly that play out with, for instance, Google and OpenAI. Google developed all the architectures, uh, the the architectures for LLMs and transformers in general, uh, before OpenAI even existed, and. There is a lot of um, sort of debate. There was a lot of debate within um, Google to actually um, decide whether or not to release these models to the public and make it available to the users. And Google had many um, sort of um, strict regulations and um, guardrails in place internally not to do so because they just felt that they were not ready to release uh, any of their models. At the same time, OpenAI. It was much more relaxed about these things, it just went ahead, released ChatGPT, had 1 million users in five days, and that was it. So obviously Google was left behind, even though from the development perspective, they were ahead. And um, this, is, this is just like one example. Another example, yeah, uh, think about what could happen if um, we had very strong regulations in EU and the US, and China obviously did not. Uh, we would see that China would move with development of this technology much faster and perhaps use it for some nefarious reasons. And again, like I believe it's it's important to have regulations in place. It's important to have global conversations conversation about it. Being realistic, it's not going to happen soon. It's going to be very, very hard. I have a feeling we will get to the point where some kind of major um, let's say tragic event happens, so something like yeah, similar to the Oppenheimer moment and situation will happen. It might it might be the case. But yeah, it is just the yeah, the the, the genie is out of the bottle. It's hard to put it back. So yeah. Um sorry, a lot of talking, but I hope that that answered the question. Yeah, it's also hard to do regulations when we don't really understand what the problem could be. And personally I perceive it as you know, and um, like making limitations to my consciousness, you couldn't really control it. You can only collaborate with it by sharing same goal. Yeah, sure. so Oleg, Oleg updated his question. So yeah. um, how can we enhance self-learning in LLMs to ensure both efficiency and accuracy without data def deficiencies? Okay, so if I understand the question correctly, the uh, we're talking about how we can actually um, using the existing data or like you know small amount of data at hand. How can we 
um, use the same LLM to um, enhance its own capabilities without perhaps increasing the, the data that is put into training and reach both efficiency and accuracy, if I'm reading it correctly. So um, I, well, basically this is at the heart of how LLM and like transformer is um, actually trained, that um, it's sort of self-reinforcing and um, the, the whole sort of like deep learning architecture backprop and so on. And it's not, um, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, sure if um, this self-learning refers to the overall training process or kind of using the same LLM to train itself or like the copies of LLMs. So yeah, sorry, I think I... Like I think you talked about self-learning models. Uh, yeah. Oleg, maybe you can elaborate more? Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, Alexi yeah. um, said thank you. It was a great answer, and I, I agree to that. Okay. okay. Same LLM teaches itself. Um, so, yeah, maybe I I think I can't answer this question directly, Oleg, I'm afraid, because I have i haven't done, like, you know, um, LLM self-teaching. Self um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Maria, maybe you have the answer to this question. No, the only thing I do is asking LLMs writing better um, like asks to, to them. So I'm like, write me a prompt to do something and they do it way better than I do. Like, yeah, this is the only thing I can say about it. Yeah. Again, the, the, maybe, you know, again, if I can uh, try again, Oleg, um, one thing I could say, like prompting itself and yeah, what Maria actually does, right? And what she described asking several times, multiple times to improve the answer. So if this is referred to self-learning, but actually I'm super curious to hear if this is something that is like a general knowledge self-learning uh, technique. Anyway, so this is one thing. And the other one is like, I could think of like creating the copies of the same LLM and having some kind of an adversarial setup where you basically help two LLMs that are the copy of each other to become better as a result of it. So. Yeah, this is this is the answer. Um. Yeah, more to add here. Like, remember, a long time ago, there have been a huge popularity of genetical algorithms mm. where you like try different versions and then you create like a kit of two best performing options and it on itself is typically performing well. Uh, so, yeah, maybe one day we will have something like that for LLMs. And next question. Let's say we are asking LLM to answer some questions based on a given text, but the original given text does not have answers to a given question. Is there some tricks to avoid hallucinations? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so usually a really simple thing that I saw work well in practice is just to ask in your prompt very directly. It's honestly unbelievable that it works don't make stuff up if you don't see the answer in the provided information. So maybe like, you know, to this question, I can uh, speak a bit about um, one solution that I worked on, which was based on uh, like actually question answering based on the given text. So it was um, for a bank and we had like really long, 100 pages long PDF files that contain some information about sustainability efforts of the companies. And we had a set of questions that were meant to be answered using the uh, these or original PDFs. And actually, the simple trick of saying, like, don't make stuff up was extremely helpful. And we saw that, um, like, in 98% of the time, if I'm not mistaken, we didn't see any hallucinations in the sample that we checked with, with the experts. So try this out. And yeah. Uh, again, grounding already helps um, to prevent hallucinations um, when the answer is present, and then the simple trick usually uh, resolves the problem. The more we talk about it, the more it actually reminds me how I talk to my consciousness. Like, Maria, like, don't make stuff up. <laughs> actually, works. 
Yeah. Okay, last chance to ask your question. And if not, let's thank to the speaker. It was very enlight enlightening and interesting to, 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 okay. Sorry, sorry, Victoria. No, no, of course not, of course not. I'm very happy to see that people are engaged. Uh, if it's, if, is it possible to improve the training of the model on the data generated by the model itself? Okay, got it. I think we got that. So the question is about using basically like uh, prompting the model, the LLM, getting the synthetic data and fitting it back to the model to hopefully have more uh, input to improve the model. I hope this is what is meant by the self-learning. Okay, cool. Oleg, maybe if you can just comment if I understood correctly. I'll answer the question that I just um, I just highlighted. Um, I, I believe that, um, well, actually the research shows that um, you will see the decrease in the model accuracy if you use synthetic data, or if you start slowly sort of polluting the training data with synthetic data that is generated by the model, you will see the decline in the model accuracy and the model performance. And therefore the answer to your question is no, based on the research and the experiments run so far, it doesn't seem that synthetic data can improve the performance of the model. If anything, it can actually make it worse. And this kind of refers to my previous point made that the sort of uh, inundation of synthetic content actually puts at risk the whole development of AI because simply, you know, we exhausted everything that we had before. We became lazy because all the stuff that we now write is so much dependent on the AI. Like personally, I don't remember the last time when I wrote an email unassisted. So it's just, you know, this sort of, um, um, yeah, like shift towards synthetic content that will make development of AI much and much harder. Yeah. So continuing with questions, uh, is there any possibility to overcome prompt engineering? Um, so I would need a bit more details on what exactly is meant here. Um, so if the question is about if the outputs that are generated using only prompt engineering can be sort of amended, then um, yes, of course, you do some kind of post-processing or you do um, additional dynamic, so-called dynamic prompt engineering, where you, you can actually use your initial prompt, get the outputs. If you don't like them based on some automatic checks, you actually change your original prompt, and then you kind of like keep iteratively improving the answer, the output. So yes, if this is a question, definitely there is a possibility, and there are many kind of techniques and ways to do that. Does it answer your question, Volodymyr? Uh, so before we, while we wait for Vladimir's details, uh, I guess maybe it was about like, because currently it's just lots of work for me, give a prompt, like or dislike answer, give another prompt. So I would guess it's about optimizing that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the details for the question were, uh, when, uh, when we make a prompt with incentive, incentifying words to get the desired results. Okay, oh, I think this is this is probably something that refers to this sneaky prompts that I talked about, um, where we can try and sneak in this nonsense and sensitive words to get the output that we want to have. I, I believe this is about these uh, naked uh, cyclists that can be sort of achieved um, as a result um, using some, some insensitive words. Um, so, I mean, we need to, yeah, it's a really, really good question actually, because I think it's just recently that it was discovered uh, that these sneaky prompts work. It's not really clear, like what is the um, characteristic of this uh, kind of like uh, gen general characteristic of all these um, weird words that actually work as substitute for the sensitive words basically like running some similar uh, experiments that these researchers uh, did to find out these um, sneaky prompts 
can actually help. So basically, yeah, like you kind of try to run some adversarial algorithm that is trying to break and in, like kind of like yeah, break the barrier. And as a result, you get um, the uh, the sets of words that work for you and can kind kind of like generalize in some way what is their common characteristic and try to embed it in the logic of your next model that you will build, then perhaps you would be able to um, overcome this uh, sort of sneaky prompt, sneaky prompt situation. Yeah, so, okay. Cool. Thank, thank you for all the questions, by the way, and being so detailed and keep asking. We really appreciate that. So our traditional reminders, firstly, please donate. There are no small amounts and we are here because of our defenders. Secondly, please spread the information about these events to your friends and colleagues. And uh, thirdly, thank you for coming. Thank you for being active and uh, spending this time with us. Thanks so much. Wonderful questions. And yeah, it's a shame I couldn't see the audience, but uh, yeah, I hope I hope it was useful for you. And yeah, please stay in touch and I'll be part of the, uh, I'm super happy to be part of the AI house community. Hopefully see you in the future. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Bye, everyone.